rabbil alamin was salatu was salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala amma ba'd assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh uh, welcome to our discovery journey how islamic civilization and sciences impacted the west uh, this is the second part uh, the first part uh, focus on the attitude of uh, uh, europeans uh, towards the legacy of uh, islamic uh, civilization and sciences and uh, in this part uh, uh, we will uh, cover inshallah the european dark age and the rise of uh, islamic civilization and sciences and uh, our interest to uh, cover the european dark age because it provides a context uh, to which uh, you know islamic civilization started and uh, uh, I would like uh, to start with the split of the Roman Empire, the, the, uh, because I had to make a decision, where do I start? And uh, I think this would be a good uh, point to start. So towards the end of the classical period, and I describe what is a classical period in, the, in, the, in, in Patuan. We're talking about the period uh, 500 years before uh, the common era uh, before the arrival of uh, Prophet Isa alayhi salam and uh, 500 years after. So towards the end of that classic, classical period, the Roman Empire, it became too large uh, you know, to, to manage, to, to rule or to be ruled because it, it covered almost uh, you know, the whole of Europe, uh, part of Africa in, the, in North Africa and part of Asia. So uh, by the third century, uh, there were a lot of uh, problems uh, within uh, the Roman uh, Empire. Uh, some of the problems were social, some economic, political, and even military problems. And there was uh, this uh, uh, fundament fundamental cultural difference between uh, the Western part and the Eastern part. First of all, they spoke different languages, they even believe uh, slightly different because the West was a Catholic and uh, the, the, the East was uh, Orthodox. And uh, there were a lot of uh, brown people uh, in, the, in the Eastern part as opposed to Caucasians in the, in the West. So all of these uh, compile into uh, problems. So uh, in the beginning of the fourth century, uh, Emperor Diocletian decided to split uh, the empire into two parts. So the western part uh, was centered around Rome, and the eastern part was centered uh, uh, in Constantinople, what is today Istanbul. Uh, so uh, practically it was still one empire, but uh, it was delegated to two different uh, emperors uh, just uh, to, to have this uh, uh, ad administrative uh, effectiveness and efficiency. But even that did not help. So uh, by the end of uh, fourth century, after the death of Emperor Theodosius I, they decided to split the, the empire into two independent states. So from there onward, these two empires, they operated independently. Now, the split of Roman Empire helped by Byzantium Empire uh, because after the collapse of Rome in the fifth century, uh, it survived for a millennium until when it was conquered by the Ottomans in the 15th century. Um, the, by, by the beginning of the fifth century, uh, Western Roman Empire started to crumble from within due to the same problem that I've just mentioned. And now there was a rivalry between uh, the East and the, and the West. So uh, the lowest moment of their history was towards the end of the fifth century when uh, uh, external forces, these barbarian forces of Germanic tribe, they invaded the uh, Western Roman Empire. And uh, uh, the, Roma, the Western Roman Empire sustained a lot of military losses uh, Rome had been entangled with barbarian forces before, and uh, some of these uh, barbarians, they were even made as, uh, you know, citizens of the Roman Empire. But to this time, this particular time, 
you had uh, two, three tribes. You have Visigoths and uh, Ostrogoths who came from the north, and you had the Vandals who came from the south. They all converged towards Rome. They ransacked the city of Rome, and uh, it fell in 476. There was also an internal uh, revolt by Germanic leader Odoesa, and uh, he deposed uh, the emperor and he abolished the Roman uh, Empire. Uh, you know, the, no, from there onward, uh, no uh, Roman Empire will rule uh, a post in Italy. And that was the end of the uh, Western Roman Empire, how it collapsed. Now, from there onwards, uh, Western Europe was now ruled by barbarian monarchs, all right? They became uh, uh, small, small states. Uh, these new Germanic rulers, they were uncivilized. They were tribal nomadic warriors uh, who did not care much about, uh, you know, civilization, about culture, about learning. And that's the reason they destroyed Rome because, uh, you know, that, that the, the Western Roman Empire was uh, an extension uh, of, the, of the Greek uh, civilization. And that explains why Europe quickly plunged into the Dark Age, the period that uh, in, in European history, when Europe lost completely its entire urban life, city life, you know, uh, institutions of learning and culture, the intellectual connection to the ancient uh, Greek philosophy. And Europe remained in the dark age for the next millennium, for the next 1000 years, until when they discover uh, Muslim knowledge in the 16th century and absorb these elements of uh, Islamic uh, civilization, sciences and innovation. Uh, the main uh, public square of the ancient Rome, the Forum, you can see the picture at the bottom on the left. Uh, this is the place where the Roman kings address uh, Roman population. It reverted into agricultural and grazing area. You know, what you see on the right, it became cow pasture or the Campo Bacino, as the Italian uh, you painter uh, uh, expresses. This is also true for most of other Western European cities, you know, at that time, you know, so Paris and London, they, they were not big cities anymore. They became, you know, uh, just like uh, uh, grazing areas, uh, agricultural areas. Now, majority of the Western Europeans, they went back to simple village life, difficult uh, rural life, without education, without healthcare, without culture, without uh, sciences and technologies, all right? So this is, uh, uh, what was the life like uh, during this uh, dark age? I compare the dark age, the European dark age is the, is the, is the Western Jahiliya. This is a, is, a, is a similar period, you know, before Islam. Medieval life in the Western Europe during the dark age was harsh, uh, with regular scarcities, famines, epidemic, endless wars, uh, no rule of law, uh, some immoralities as well, ignorance and barbarism. So there was no organized system of welfare. A state welfare came to the West only in the 20th century. In contrast, a state welfare was first established in the Muslim world in the seventh century during the time of uh, Khalifa Umar. Uh, during the dark age, most of the Western Europe's uh, public infrastructure also crumbled. For the most part, the road networks, the bridges and public buildings were crippled because there were nobody to maintain them. In contrast, the Islamic civilization was primarily urban civilization where cities played very critical role in shaping the civilization itself and shipping sciences and culture. And great Muslim cities enjoy all modern amenities that you, know, you can think of, like running water, extensive road network, paved and lighted streets. You know, municipality was uh, working uh, and security, people were living in peace uh, and security. There were large multi-story buildings, public gardens, public baths, schools and universities, libraries, you know, all of these uh, 
amenities, uh, hospitals that you will expect in a, in a modern city. So that was the condition uh, of Europe uh, at the time Islam arrived. So by the time Islam arrived in the seventh century, uh, what was remaining is these two uh, big uh, superpowers, the Eastern part of the Roman Empire, the Byzant Byzantine Empire, or Byzantium Empire, and the Sassanian, or Sassanian Empire, the Persians. And, uh, and these two empires also, they were in, always in conflicts. And uh, there was a big conflict uh, that took place during uh, the Prophet Muhammad's lifetime. And this was documented in the Quran in Surah al -Rum. Eventually, both of these two empires will be conquered by Muslims gradually, and uh, you know, they'll be assimilated into the Muslim world. Now, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, the, the situation. Islam, it arrived in the seventh century. And uh, the arrival of Islam gave uh, Muslim a very powerful rational world view. That's why they were able to spin off this beautiful uh, civilization. Because the, 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 the Tawheed gave Muslims very rational worldview compared to all other beliefs that, uh, you know, that uh, were available at that time. Islamic civilization, it established itself as a sacred civilization as opposed to like the modern civilization, the Western civilization today is uh, secular. It, has, it, it uh, opposes religion and it does not respect religion as such. Uh, Islamic civilization was a sacred civilization, rational. It was knowledge-based. Uh, it was a human focus. So people who talk about humanism, uh, they have not really studied Islam because Islam, Islamic civilization is really human focused. It is ethical based. Uh, a lot of emphasis in ethics, not only in the, in the prayers, but uh, ethical, you know, uh, activities in in all human endeavors, and it was uh, it it has always been always been religious tolerant and cultural tolerant. Uh, the Western civilization it is still learning to be tolerant, both in terms of religion and culture, and we can see this today. Islam did not uh, experience uh, tension between faith and reason, religion and science, or religion and philosophy, as in the case of uh, Judeo-Christian tradition. And the Quran not only provided the essential teachings of Islamic principles and values for human salvation, it's, it's not only focused on the Akhirah, but it also inspired early Muslims to acquire knowledge and learning, and it gave them the spirit of rational investigation, discovery and embrace of sciences and innovations. And it was the Quran that infused in the early Muslim, the spirit of experimentation, observation and measurement. And this is the basis of modern science. And it gave them that emotional power to succeed. So uh, when we start to talk about, uh, you know, the rise of uh, Islamic civilization and sciences, a good uh, starting point will be uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Damascus. Because here, you know, after three decades uh, of the reign of the four rightly guided uh, caliphs, or uh, Rashidun, the Islamic Caliphate was now transformed into a dynasty. And the Umayyad dynasty was the first one to be established in 661 uh, with its capital in Damascus. So now the capital of uh, Islam was moved from Medina, uh, where it was established by the Prophet Muhammad and his uh, four rightly guided caliphs. Now it has moved to Damascus. Now, at this time, the Muslim landmass and population under Umayyad, it was large, very large, and it posed some challenges in, in the way to rule, you know, the, the Muslim world at that time. So the Umayyads introduced many reforms 
in education and learning, in public administration and finance, in trade and commerce, in many areas, agriculture, they introduced many, many uh, reforms. And it is during this period, the pursuit of science, it started, it began in various fronts. And the reason, because the Umayyad, they were interested to find the solutions to real life problems. Okay, so science was a vehicle for them to be able to help them uh, to govern the, you know, the, the, the Muslim world. So this is uh, the period also, there was uh, the development of the major schools of jurisprudence. This is another intellectual activity. So uh, it was not only uh, uh, science in a secular sense, but also science in religious studies. So this is a time where this many school of jurisprudence were established, systematic studies of uh, the prophet hadith, it kicked off during this period and uh, uh, prophets and biographies and uh, jurisprudence methodology or usul al-fiqh, the study of usul al-fiqh started at this period. Uh, during the Umayyad time, uh, you can say the Umayyad mosque and the Dome of the Rocks are uh, among the important architectural achievement of the Umayyad dynasty. Uh, the Umayyad mosque was the first big uh, mosque the, the, the Prophet's Mosque in Medina, it was uh, relatively smaller and uh, simpler in its construction. And uh, here, the Umayyad Mosque, uh, the, the, the purpose it was, uh, you know, to kind of uh, posture this uh, new civilization uh, because, uh, you know, uh, Damascus was very close to the uh, Byzantium uh, Empire. And it was a former uh, part of uh, Byzantium. And therefore, uh, now Islam is uh, uh, presenting itself as a civilization uh, to compete or to, you know, to, to succeed uh, those other civilizations. Now, uh, uh, Umayyad, by, by the time the Umayyad dynasty started, uh, uh, you know, the whole of uh, Arabian Peninsula, part of uh, you know, part of uh, Iraq, Iraq uh, part of uh, uh, Persia or Iran, what, what you, what you uh, call Iran today. Um, also, um, part of India, uh, part of uh, Pakistan, uh, India and then Pakistan, it was one, uh, one, one block. Uh, part of what is today Afghanistan, they were all, uh, you know, uh, came to Islam uh, during uh, by the by the end of the the four rightly guided caliphs, so Umayyad dynasty inherited that, but also territorial expansions continued during uh, Umayyad time uh, to North Africa, to Iberian Peninsula, which is this uh, Muslim Spain, uh, what became Andalusia, uh, Eastern Anatolia, which is part of uh, now Turkey and uh, uh, Caucasus as well, uh, these areas between the Black Sea and Caspian Sea and part of uh, Central Asia. And in the process of conquest uh, and empire building, the Umayyads revived the ancient historical intellectual centers, uh, the Hellenistic uh, centers, which was closed by the, the Roman Catholic Church uh, towards, uh, you know, uh, fourth and, and, and end of fifth century. Uh, we talk about that uh, in the previous uh, talk. So uh, places like, uh, you know, in Syria, uh, in Merv, uh, what, what is, uh, uh, what is the, today uh, Turkuman and uh, Sumerian in uh, what is today Iraq and uh, many centers in Persia and in India, because now all these uh, geography is under the one umbrella of the, the Omaya dynasty. So uh, not only they, they revived them, but they restored also ties so that they can have uh, uh, intellectual uh, connection. Another major contribution of the Omaya dynasty to the rise of Islamic civilization uh, and sciences is the decision that was made by Abdul Malik Ibn Marwan uh, Khalifa Abdul Malik bin Arwan to make Arabic as the lingua franca of the Muslim world. Okay, because this paved the way to make Arabic as international language of learning and science. Uh, 
so all these impo important intellectual centers uh, that thrived across uh, the region from Edessa in, in Syria to the Iranian city of uh, Jundishapur, Haran in uh, Turkey, okay, and Merv in the Turkmenistan, all of these, uh, you know, they, they were revived and uh, they started to flourish. And uh, it offering the empire a formidable body of indigenous linguistic skills, philosophical and scientific talent, and uh, knowledge of uh, multiculture. So, uh, the Umayyad uh, created that uh, the the right environment, really, to start, uh, you know, the 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 scientific uh, progress. Now, the Umayyad were overthrown by the Abbasid in 750, mid eighth century, and uh, the Abbasid they moved the the capital from Damascus uh, to Baghdad. They built basically a new uh, city of Baghdad. And Baghdad was quite innovative city uh, when it was uh, built. It was a circular shape. Initially, it was called Medina al Salam, and then it was renamed to Baghdad. And it was meant uh, really to compete and to overshadow Damascus. Baghdad was uh, uh, strategically uh, selected and located because it is between the two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates. Uh, and the rivers always provided, uh, uh, you know, uh, energy for uh, civilizations. And therefore it was uh, an ideal spot for trade and cultural exchange and uh, intellectual exchange as well, socioeconomic development, food production. And it was meant to sustain a, a very large population. Now, what is important is at the epicenter of Baghdad, it was this Royal Academy that came to be known House of Wisdom or Beit al Hikmah, and uh, this oh, uh, this this place uh, became the venue of a massive translation movement that took place in the eighth and ninth century uh, to translate ancient knowledge into Arabic. Now the Abbasids uh, uh, they they gave a big push to sciences and learning during the Islamic uh, history. Many of the Abbasid rulers, they were great patrons of sciences. Uh, they wanted to create an, an intellectual culture that rivaled that of classical Babylon and the classical Greece. So the Abbasid really, they had a vision, you know, to, to, to develop uh, this civilization. Now, just to highlight a little bit about uh, Beit al-Hikmah, uh, because Baghdad boasted itself with this top intellectual center of the of the of that time of the day, the House of Wisdom of Beit al Hikmah. Uh, it is a, a, a learning center. It was a brainchild of Abbasid rulers, as I said, and but it grew very large during the time of Khalifa al Mamun uh, in the uh, early ninth century. And uh, Mamun he brought uh, and he su and supported financially the top scholars from all over the Muslim world. He picked them, you know, in the, the ones who were in Syria, in, uh, in Persia, in India, you know, everywhere. In, and he brought them uh, in one place. And, uh, you know, he, he kept them under one roof. Uh, and uh, the center was also augmented with whatever that they needed in terms of resources. There was a huge multilingual library and there was a huge astronomical observatory center as well. The center was drawing manuscripts from all ancient civilization, you know, from Greek, from Persian, from Indian, uh, you know, civilization, from Chinese, in various field. And they were, were being systematically uh, translated into Arabic. They were studied, they were critiqued, and uh, some new ideas were being built from them. Now, some of the famous Greek works, uh, you know, like uh, Ptolemy's Astronomy or Galen's uh, and Hippocrates' Medicine, Euclid's Geometry, Pythagoras, and some of these philosophers, Aristotle and Plato, all these works were now available in Arabic. Not only they were available in Arabic, but they were critique as well. They were, they, they, they were writing commentary on, on these, uh, these works. And uh, just to, for you to appreciate, uh, you know, the translation work, we, we are not talking about uh, linguistic translation only, because uh, 
you know, any one of us who is bilingual, let's say, if you speak uh, English and Arabic, and uh, if you are given uh, uh, a manuscript of medicine in, in English, and if you are asked to translate into Arabic, if you didn't have a medical background, you will not be able to do it. All right, it's not possible because uh, you will not make sense the concepts, you will not make sense the terminology. So this translation work is uh, because the word translation sometimes simplifies it, is much, much more than that. Now scholars at the House of Wisdom accumulated the greatest collection of world knowledge. It means that they had much better world view of this knowledge because of, uh, you know, they could see the differences. Yeah? You know, they look at uh, uh, data that was collected uh, from the Indian, you know, uh, sources as opposed to the Persian sources or to the Greek sources, and they could make out the difference. To some extent, I think uh, they had to start from zero because with all these differences, they had to start uh, fresh. Uh, and this, uh, whatever that they did at that time, whatever they accumulated at that time, it really became the foundation of modern sciences and modern world. Now, uh, as time went on, the centralized authority of Baghdad devolved to new independent centers of power and learning across the Muslim world. Institutions of learning and uh, research, they sprang up uh, across the Muslim world to rival each other. Knowledge seekers from all over the known world, they benefited from learning hubs. You know, there were so many hubs, you know, Baghdad, Damascus, Bukhara, Fars, Shiraz, many places, all right? Uh, polymath figures, these are uh, uh, intellectual thinkers who uh, specialize in multidisciplines, such as Al-Kindi, Farabi, Ibn Al-Haytham, Al-Biruni, Al-Khawarzmi. They shone like uh, stars in the sky with new ideas and innovations. And Baghdad itself, it became a cosmopolitan modern metropolis and a center of learning and culture with plenty of wealth and opportunities. And it attracted you know, a lot of talents uh, from all over the known world. Uh, by the ninth and 10th century, if you wanted to read classical Greek works, for example, you know, uh, such as the work of Aristotle and uh, Plato or, or Ptolemy or Galen or Hippocrates, you could not do it in Europe because it's too, it was not available. It was only available in Arabic and in the Muslim world. Most of uh, what was, whatever that was remained in the, with the you know, Greek manuscripts, they had already vanished uh, in the West. Uh, so if they wanted to read, they need to go to the Muslim world and they need to learn Arabic in order to, to learn this. So all the intellectual activities uh, on all areas, the philosophy, astronomy, medicine, you know, and sciences in general, they were going on in the Muslim world and they were conducted in Arabic. And Arabic became the international language of scholarship. The Abbasid period uh, probably represented the Muslims golden age in terms of intellectual activities, sciences and innovation. And it was also a good uh, modern prosperous living as well. Uh, just to quote uh, in a 13th century Arab historian and geographer, Yaqut al hamawi uh, he said, he wrote this, he said, the city of Baghdad was covered with parks, gardens, villas, and beautiful promenades, and plentiful supplied with rich bazaars and finely mosques and birth, stretched for a considerable distance on both sides of the river. Now, uh, in, uh, in the early 10th century, there was a group of Ismailis uh, from the Shia school of jurisprudence from North Africa who declared Abdullah al-Mahdi or Ubaidullah as the new caliph. And Abdullah al-Mahdi was claimed to have descended from the prophet's daughter Fatima, for which reason they were called themselves, they called themselves the Fatimids. So this is the uh, establishment of the Fatimid uh, uh, dynasty. Uh, by middle of the uh, uh, 10th century, uh, they directly challenged the authority of the Abbasid and uh, they seized uh, Egypt 
which was once very important economic and cultural center of the Abbasid. And from Egypt, the Fatimid, they were well situated to compete in the Mediterranean sea trade. And uh, the Fatimid uh, extended their caliphate and they included uh, uh, North Africa and also uh, they entered Europe uh, in Sicily and Malta and some other islands in Mediterranean. Palermo, which is the uh, capital city of Sicily, it became uh, a vital Muslim city and uh, intellectual hub in Europe in the same way as uh, Cordoba became in Andalusia. And we'll talk about uh, you know, the, the Andalusia, inshallah. That will soon be another important point of contact uh, with the West. The Fatimid uh, also established a new city of Cairo. Uh, uh, the, the Arabic word uh, for Cairo is victory which gave them the resource of the agriculture of the Nile Valley to draw upon. Uh, Cairo was built as a large and modern city with a good city planning when it was built, robust infra infrastructure and the busy bazaars. They had the very liberal policies and a lot of cultural activities. The Fatimid built the world's second university uh, in the 10th century, towards the end of 10th century, Al Azhar. Uh, the first one was built uh, in Fars uh, by a lady, uh, Fatima Al Fihri. We'll talk about that when we have a talk about education. Soon it became an important center of learning uh, in the Islamic world for both religious and natural sciences. Now, under Fatimids, Egypt enjoyed enormous prosperity, primarily, pr primarily because of the lucrative uh, trade in the, between Mediterranean and Indian at that time. So Cairo soon, it rivaled the, uh, the capital uh, of Baghdad, the, the Abbasid capital of Baghdad. And also these uh, uh, Fatimid uh, rulers, you know, they practice uh, luxury living and uh, they triggered a renaissance in the decorative arts and uh, you can see that in Egypt, uh, in uh, the city of Fustad, uh, it became a major center of production of pottery, glass, crystals, metalwork, ivory and wood carving, and uh, textile factories. And the artwork from this period exemplified the creativity and ingenuity of Fatimid uh, craftsmen. When I was uh, search researching this, you see this. Uh, this glass uh, pot, uh, the picture of the glass pot, this uh, from the Fatimid dynasty, it was sold in England for 2.2 million pounds, amazing. The Fatimid dynasty was defeated in uh, uh, 12th century, early 12th century by uh, Salahuddin al Ayyubi. Now, uh, this is a map of uh, Fatimid dynasty at its peak. And, uh, th you know, the purple, it shows the areas uh, extended uh, for, you know, Fatimid dynasty. At some point, they even took uh, part of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and uh, you can see the Sicily over there in Europe. But what is interesting is uh, you need to remember uh, these three uh, dynasties, they were coexisting simultaneously. You know, the Abbasid, which is centered in Baghdad, and there was Umayyad Caliphate uh, dynasty in Cordoba, in, in Andalus, all right, centered in Cordoba. They, you know, they kind of existed at the same time. Uh, the Palermo in Sicily was a very important Islamic intellectual hub, I already said that. Later, it became a venue for transfer of Islamic knowledge sciences and innovation to the Western Europe through uh, personal context. Uh, uh, also European, they used to send the people there to study, so study scholarship and uh, through translation centers. Uh, the fall of Sicily to the Norman kingdom in the 12th century, it followed Andalusian pattern. You know, uh, the Norman dynasty that ruled over Southern Italy, they took the opportunity to invade the island in 1052, when they saw weakness in Sicilian Muslim and they saw uh, division among, among themselves. 
and they could not defend the island and they could not get support from North Africa because in North Africa also, there was a preoccupation with uh, some kind of uh, tribal wars or civil wars. So by the beginning of the 12th century, most of the island was under Norman's control. Palermo, it fell in uh, 1072, Syracuse uh, in 1085, uh, and this coincidentally, uh, it also, there is Andalusian city of Toledo, we'll talk about it, very important. It fell to uh, Castilian uh, kingdom. Um, uh, most of these attacks actually, they were coordinated. And the final outpost uh, of Islamic control in Sicily is this uh, city of Noto, uh, which fell in 1090. Like in Andalus, uh, a Muslim population continued to live under Christian rule and treatment of the Muslims was dependent on the aims and temperament of the Norman kings in power at, the, at that time. And uh, the reign of Roger II uh, was particularly considered as the most tolerant because Roger II was considered uh, uh, much more appreciative to Islamic civilization some people, they will consider him a friend of Muslims. Now, uh, the, when the Umayyads uh, were overthrown by the Abbasid in the mid of the uh, uh, 8th century in Damascus, uh, there was one Umayyad Amir, Abdul Rahman I, who managed to escape uh, to South Spain. And uh, he established uh, an independent Umayyad Caliphate in Cordoba in the 756. So under Lucia, under the Umayyad, excel in intellectual fields as in other Muslim centers of learning in, in all areas, you know. Uh, and the, and the Lucia also produced many polymaths, you know, thinkers with uh, uh, multi-disciplines. So you had people like uh, Zahrawi, who was the father of uh, medical surgery uh, Ibn Hazm, Ibn Rushd, the Zarqali, who was an astronomer. Uh, the Umayyads in Andalusia, they lasted until 1492 during the last Reconquista. Okay, and Reconquista is to recon reconquer. You know, this is the word they use uh, Spanish to reconquer because they felt the Muslim conquered Spain and therefore they need to reconquer. So 1492 is the fall of uh, Granada to Isabella and Ferdinand. And it followed Inquisition, uh, which drove the last Muslim out of Spain. Inquisition is a process uh, the, the Spaniard, the Christians, they use uh, to convert by force Muslims or the uh, acts of violence, they kill them. And uh, uh, if they resisted, they drove them out of Spain. And the Spain became illegal to be a Muslim uh, from 15th century until uh, a relief came in the 19th century, 20th century. You know, in between, it was illegal to be a Muslim in Spain. Now, the great mosque of Cordoba, Alhambra Palace, and Medina Tez Zahra are among the most architectural achievements of Umayyad in uh, Spain. And uh, when we talk about uh, the contribution of Muslims in area of architecture, we will visit uh, these monuments uh, again. Uh, Baghdad, the 9th century Baghdad and the 10th century Cordoba, they were considered like wonders of the world at the time. You know, considering Europe is in the dark age, uh, Baghdad and Cordoba, they were the most civilized cities in the world, wealthy, trendy, and magnets to intellectual and cultural minds. So when rulers of uh, these barbaric uh, or barbarian rulers of France and England and Italy, when they need a consultant or a surgeon or an architect or even a dressmaker, they will contact Baghdad or Cordoba. In the same way today, many of uh, Muslim countries, when they want uh, expertise, they will go to the West. Life in the 9th and 10th century Baghdad and Cordoba was a pleasurable experience. And we have a lot of uh, writings, you know, that explain the, how the cities were and how life was. The cities were well planned. They were built in stone houses and palaces. They had the lighted pep streets. 
uh, they had running water. There were plenty of universities and huge libraries. When libraries were, you know, the idea of library and book book bookshop, it was uh, non-existence in in the West at that time. Uh, hospital as well and pharmacy. These things didn't exist in the West. All right. Uh, they had to learn this uh, from uh, from the Muslims. So even garbage was collected on regular basis, and in some areas they had underground sewage system. Yeah, even today in uh, in uh, in this time, there are many places here that we don't have uh, underground sewage system. So this is uh, showing uh, the map of uh, the Caliphate of Cordoba. Uh, the green area is the Caliphate of Cordoba, and the top area, these are different uh, uh, tribes, uh, uh, Christian tribes uh, from the north uh, the, who are independent uh, because, uh, you know, they resisted the uh, Muslim uh, uh, con conquest or opening. Uh, the, unfortunately, the Caliphate of Cordoba did not last uh, for very long. Uh, it lasted for 250 years, and it collapsed in 1031. And the reason it collapsed because of internal conflicts, as usual, Muslim, you know, always don't agree with each other. Uh, the Caliphate of Cordoba, it split into 24 Paifas, city-states. And uh, these city-states were very weak because they were overstated as states. They could not, most of the time, they could not defend uh, themselves independently. So the breakup of the Caliphate, it weakened the Muslims and provided ideal condition to the Christians of the North to grab the Muslim territories. And as they grab territories, of course, they grab the Muslim knowledge as well, because they will take the universities, the institutions, the industries, and you know all that uh, other facilities. So Christian rulers from the North, they initiated this uh, conquest or reconquest, whatever you, you, know, the, uh, you like to call it, uh, a tax that will last for 500 years plus. Toledo was the first one to fall, you know, that big chunk that you see at the center. Uh, so Toledo is a very important name to remember, uh, you know, in the history of uh, uh, Islamic civilization. Toledo was the first to fall into Christian hands in 1085, which had a dis uh, decisive impact on the, on the history uh, of Islamic civilization and uh, uh, the rise of uh, Europeans as well, because Christians were astounded by the extent of Islamic civilization and they were overwhelmed by the sheer number of books they saw in Toledo for the first time. You know, people even they had their private uh, libraries. Uh, you know, uh, in, in Cordoba, I know in Cordoba, uh, the, 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 uh, rulers, they had a library uh, so big, you know, when you look at uh, even by today's standard, uh, the library was so big. We're talking about uh, 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 close to a million books at that time. Uh, and we're talking about a time when uh, there were no printing press, there were no uh, desktop publishing, there were no Xerox machine. These books, they have to be copied by, you know, each each copy has to be written down by hand. So the Reconquista, as I said, this was a period in history of the Iberian Peninsula of about 500 years from the fall of Toledo, 1085, to the fall of the last kingdom, uh, Nasrid kingdom of Granada in 1492. And uh, the North, Northern Castilian kingdom took advantage of the breakup of the Cordoban Caliphate. Uh, so constantly they were taking uh, the Muslim territories and uh, as you can see, uh, these pictures, if you look into the top picture from the left, by 1031, look at the, 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 the difference, the contrast between the yellow region and the green region. You know, as time uh, unfolds, the green region, it was marginalized until by 1300, uh, in the 14th century, the beginning of 14th century, uh, what was remaining is only Granada, and even Granada, it fell in 1492. Okay, so as Northern Castilians gain Muslim territory, they also gain Muslim knowledge and learning institutions, books and libraries, innovations and research centers and industries and crafts as well. All right. 
So uh, Toledo is very important because, uh, you know, Toledo is the real birthplace of Renaissance or European Renaissance. It's not Italy, it's not uh, uh, Florence as, you know, as uh, the Europeans claim. The, the real uh, birth or place of uh, European Renaissance, it was here in Toledo. Because here the Christian West, they knew the significance of Muslim learning and sciences and their eagerness to appropriate uh, Muslim knowledge, it beca began in this 12th century after the fall of Toledo. So reconquista of Muslim lands and requisition of Muslim knowledge, it went always hand in hand. And uh, there was a massive translation movement of Muslim uh, uh, scientific and philosophical works from Arabic to Latin, uh, which took place in Toledo in the 12th and 13th century. Among the most uh, famous one, uh, Christian European intellectuals who learned and mastered Arabic language for the purpose of translation, we know the names and uh, you know we have their history uh, and the work that they did. Uh, okay, so just to, you know, to highlight some of the names like Robert of Chester, uh, very famous, uh, Gerard uh, of Cremona, Daniel of Maudley, these are all known if you Google and you can read their histories and what they have done. Robert of Curtin, I think he, he also translated the Quran, the first person to translate the Quran in the European language in Latin. Uh, and you can see most of these activities uh, happen in the 12th and, uh, and 13th century. All of them, they live in 12th and 13th century. Just to quote this uh, historian, uh, contemporary historian, Egrant, uh, you know, who wrote the foundation of modern science in the Middle Ages, he said the Latin scholars in the 12th century were painfully aware that with respect to science and natural philosophy, their civilization was manifestly inferior to that of Islam. They faced an obvious choice, either to learn from their superiors or remain forever inferior. So they chose to learn and launch a massive effort to translate as many Arabic texts into Latin as was uh, feasible. Uh, also, uh, this was a time uh, in 12th century and uh, 13th century, not only there was a, a massive translation movement of translating Arabic knowledge into Latin, but also establishment of uh, the first universities or learning institutions uh, in Europe. The traditional European centers of learning and culture, they were actually monasteries. And they were like islands or oases in a sea of ignorance and barbarism. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans, strange enough, had no universities in the same sense, the way we use the word, the meaning of university. So universities appeared in the Christian West only in the 12th century after the fall of Toledo. The fall of Toledo in 1085 gave Europeans access to the massive Muslim knowledge and culture where they not only established translation centers to translate the knowledge, but also to transfer manuscript to other European cities where they could establish Muslim style universities. And among the first universities to be established, it was uh, Salano in Italy, uh, in the you know in the in the first uh, in in the in the beginning of 12th century, uh, and uh, it was followed by University of Bologna, also in Italy and Paris, uh, towards end of 12th century, and then uh, early uh, 13th century they established Oxford, and you can, you know, you people have written. Uh, you know, uh, case studies, you know, Oxford being a very uh, Islamic or Muslim university uh, at its initial stage. And then followed by Cambridge, uh, Angers in France, Padua in Italy, Montpellier in France, and Naples in Italy. Naples was established by Roger II uh, when he seek uh, help from the Muslim to establish uh, uh, that university. Most of these universities, they will teach initially Islamic sciences and they will teach Arabic, mo almost all of them, because uh, that was the only thing that was available at that time. So following the steps of the Christian armies of Alfonso who conquered Toledo, 
Christian scholars also from many Western European countries and cities, they rushed down to Toledo to unearth the Muslim treasure chest of knowledge. Toledo, because had amassed large amounts of scientific works. Now, although Toledo was the principal focal point for translation uh, movement, but there were other centers as well uh, in Spain, in France, in Italy, uh, who did uh, the same uh, work. All right. Now, I want to quote also this another, uh, you know, contemporary historian uh, who said, uh, you know, commenting about the treasure shed, chest of uh, learning from uh, Muslim Spain. Uh, he said, uh, brought about the excited discovery that it was indeed the Muslims who were the true representatives of classical knowledge and the giants on whose shoulders Latin science and philosophy had to be placed. This is a, the picture that you see on the left uh, is a, a copy of a translation that was uh, uh, done from the uh, from a Muslim uh, uh, manuscript. Now this picture really summarizes the genesis of uh, Islamic uh, sciences and philosophy. So on the left, uh, when we talk about ancient uh, knowledge, uh, it was in Baghdad in the eighth and ninth century uh, at the house of uh, uh, Beit al-Hikmah, uh, uh, where translation movement took place of the Greek Latin knowledge and uh, as well as a Persian and Indian knowledge and to some extent Chinese knowledge as well. And uh, the, the Greeks, uh, they got their knowledge from the Egyptians and the Babylonians. Okay, so I'm just stressing the source. Now, uh, what the Muslim did, they did the translation. Okay, so this was uh, involving critical analysis, commentaries, improvements, uh, and uh, new ideas, because there were some things that were not existing in the Greek, uh, uh, in ancient Greek, like uh, algebra, it did not exist. So algebra is a, is a new area uh, that was uh, uh, discovered in Islam. Uh, also chemistry, uh, Greeks didn't have chemistry. Uh, di Greeks didn't have uh, 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 trigonometry, for example. So these are new ideas also. And, uh, but uh, it's not only the translation because if it were only translation, we could not, uh, you know, have uh, uh, the, the scientific revolution as such. The scientific revolution and the modern scientific revolution, actually it came because of the scientific methodology. You know, this knowledge was existing all this time, but uh, nothing happened. Nobody made any improvement for, for centuries, all right, on this knowledge. But it was the Muslim methodology that allowed actually, you know, to, you know, to kind of critique and to be able to uh, produce uh, some uh, new ideas out, out of it. Uh, and therefore, this uh, scientific methodology, including experimentation, observation, measurements, and verification. Now, uh, in Toledo, this is what happened in 12th and 13th century. This was the beginning of the Europeans to have access to uh, knowledge. And uh, at this point, you know, Europeans always they talk about the ancient knowledge as if the ancient, you know, directly gave them the knowledge, but that was totally a, a different thing now, because this is not just the ancient knowledge. This is ancient knowledge with commentary, with improvement, with new ideas, but on top of it with a scientific methodology. So uh, I, I wanted to give this idea of like two bridges. You know, the European, they had to cross two bridges. You know, the bridge of uh, translation and also a bridge of uh, scientific uh, method. And actually we could put the uh, three bridges, also a bridge of new ideas. So uh, the medieval Europe, uh, you know, they kind of uh, struggled with this knowledge, uh, but uh, they didn't have uh, yet, they didn't master it and have uh, the confidence until in 17th century. So in 17th and 18th century, this knowledge was also translated into modern, uh, uh, European languages, and the period between A and B is 500 years, and between B and C is another 500 years, and therefore you're talking about between A and C, one, one, 1,000 years, a full millennium. We mentioned this uh, in, the, in the previous talk that uh, I'm running out of time, 
Uh, I hope, uh, Dr. Yusuf, you can give me five minutes. Uh, it's, uh, we, we, we mentioned that uh, the, uh, the classical knowledge, uh, it was not, uh, it is, is a pre-scientific in a sense, because it was not really uh, science as such, it was uh, natural philosophy. Uh, because the Greeks, uh, they were theoreticians and the philosophers, but they were not experimental scientists. And experimental scientists is it really an invention that came uh, from the Muslim. And the Muslim, if, if you read, uh, if you read the history of science today, uh, the West, they claim that the modern scientific method, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, modern science is a European invention. And usually they, they attribute it to Roger Bacon, okay, in his famous work, uh, uh, Opus Majus, or, uh, you know, our, our or my uh, optics. Uh, and then they, they also mention about Francis Bacon and uh, Rene Descartes. But actually, uh, the West pretends to be blind of the pivotal and original works of Muslim scholars in the field of scientific method and epistemological criticism that preceded the Renaissance for at least 500 years. And uh, I can just cite uh, some of the works, uh, you know, like Ibn al-Haytham, he wrote uh, doubts on Ptolemy. Uh, uh, Zakaria Razi also, he wrote uh, something uh, on uh, doubts on Galen. Uh, Ibn Sina, he wrote uh, on demonstration or Al-Burhan. Al-Ghazali, he, he wrote uh, Al-Munkid bin Al-Dalal or Deliverance uh, from Error and Fakhreddin al-Razi also. So uh, this idea of, uh, you know, of uh, uh, intellectual doubts as a source, as a, as a you know, as a way to, to, to get knowledge, as a source of knowledge, it was not, uh, it was not European. European, they took it uh, from uh, the Muslim. If you just uh, look into the profile of Roger Bacon, uh, himself, the one that they give, they attribute, uh, you know, this idea to him. Now, Roger Bacon uh, lived in the 13th century, and he was known uh, in the in the West as being the most enlightened person of the medieval period uh, in Christian Europe. But uh, you know, historians they recognize him also as being a promoter of uh, uh, Muslim sciences in, in 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 Europe. Not only promoter, but implementer as well. And uh, if you look at his profile, he studied Arabic and he studied Arabic sciences from Oxford and Paris, because at that time in Oxford and Paris, you, the only thing that you could study in terms of science is uh, Muslim science, Arabic sciences, all right? And you needed to study Arabic because the manuscripts also, you know, uh, most of the work will, you will need to access in Arabic. So, and Bacon also uh, concluded his studies in, the, in Cordoba, he went to Andalusia. Uh, now, the ch when he came back, because the church was very hostile to rationalism at that time, uh, Bacon had to undergo uh, imprisonment, like uh, other uh, famous, uh, you know, uh, European thinkers. And uh, it's interesting, this historian, a very uh, uh, authoritative historian, George Sutton, uh, and Robert uh, Brifold, uh, both of them, they live in the previous centuries, uh, have concluded that the, the, the Opus Majus, or his optics, is actually a Latin translation of Ibn al-Haytham, Magnum Opus, uh, seven volume, Kitab al-Manadir, or book of uh, optics. Now, today, most of the European, they will attribute optics, all right, uh, to Isaac Newton. All right, if you pick any physics books, this is what it tells you. And to that, to that, to, to that matter, even Muslims, they, they kind of uh, believe in that. But nobody talks about Ibn al-Haytham, who investigated virtually every aspect of light, every aspect of human sight, mirrors, lenses, even the idea that uh, lenses can magnify, it was already established by Ibn al-Haytham. So Galileo, when he developed his, uh, you know, his uh, telescope, he was fully using the knowledge, you know, of uh, Ibn al-Haytham. In fact, Ibn al-Haytham, if he had lived long enough, probably he would have made the, the telescope. This is similar, we find, in other areas. For example, 
some of you who might have uh, studied this in, uh, in physics, uh, Snell's law, uh, which is, uh, this, it, it gives you the law of uh, refraction. Many uh, physics books today, or all physics books, they will uh, attribute this to Snell and uh, to Descartes. But in fact, this same thing you can go and read, you know, from the work of Ibn Sahal, who died in 1,000 uh, years. And he, this work was done in, uh, in uh, end of uh, 10th century. And exactly, you know, he, he, he established this uh, ratio or this uh, relationship. Uh, uh, Ibn Haytham, he wrote 92 works. 60 survived, 16 uh, on optics, of which 11 survived. And the book of optics is only one of them. There were many conflicting theories of optics that were inherited uh, from the ancient Greeks, uh, but Ibn al-Haytham, through meticulous experiment, he dispelled all of them. And Ibn al-Haytham optics work was holistic because he not only studied uh, in the optics, but he also involved geometry, uh, anatomy, eyes anatomy, physiology, uh, color, vi visualization, uh, brain function. Uh, he also included work from the previous, uh, you know, uh, thinkers as well. Uh, in all his books, he meticulously described the experiments he conducted. So he's the first one to conduct experiments. The, uh, and uh, the specific designs of equipment he used and his observations and his conclusion. And his book, of course, was uh, translated into Latin in the 12th century. This is a list of the books uh, on optics and the one in red, uh, these are uh, one that have uh, disappeared. How do we know this? Because, uh, you know, we make a reference uh, from a bibliographer, Ibn Nadim, Fihrist of Ibn Nadim. He listed all the, in, you know, the intellectuals who publish uh, in the 10th century uh, onwards. And uh, uh, you, can, you can see that Ibn al-Haytham seven volume magnum opus, Kitab al-Manadir, was read by all of these Europeans, uh, uh, Renaissance uh, thinkers. And uh, it is the basis of their work, you know, both their work on optics and their work on scientific uh, method. And I'm not going to read this, uh, but Ibn Haytham, he just give you an indication that, uh, you know, he studied all the aspects of uh, vision, of uh, optics. Uh, this is, uh, uh, he was honored by this guy, Johannes Hevelius. He wrote this book uh, uh, that uh, is, is called uh, Selenographia, which basically uh, it gives uh, the surface maps of uh, moon of the moon and diagrams uh, of the moon, the craters. This is uh, on, the on the right, this is one of the page uh, inside the book which shows the craters. Uh, he uh, honored uh, Ibn al-Haytham and uh, Galileo, but uh, look at what, he, what he, he does. If you look at uh, closely uh, on the platform where Galileo, who is on the left, it's written Al-Hassan because his name actually is uh, 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 Abu Ali Al-Hassan uh, Ibn Al-Haytham. So Al-Hassan is a Latinized name of Ibn, Ibn Al-Haytham. And uh, uh, there is a picture of a brain and the, underneath he put, he put it uh, uh, rational, uh, meaning uh, Ibn Al-Haytham, he represents reason. But uh, Galileo, he, he used the reason of Ibn Al-Haytham and uh, he produced an instrument, uh, and uh, he put uh, he represented it with the eye as a sense. So to end uh, the the talk, Ibn Al Haytham was the first scientist ever, the first the father of scientific method, uh, which make him the father of modern science, and he was definitely the father of modern optics. Now at, at last in 2015. United Nations body of UNESCO, they honored Ibn al-Haytham for his immense contribution in the field of optics and physics uh, when they celebrated the year of light. 200 countries, they voted for his recognition and honor, which came after a thousand years. And uh, this is a quotation of, uh, from Ibn al-Haytham's uh, book, uh, Doubts on Ptolemy, 
listen to what he says because uh, this is shows that he established the scientific methodology uh, a thousand years ago. The seeker of truth is not one who studies the ancient writings and puts his truth, his trust in them, but rather the one who suspects them and questions what he gathers from them. The one who submits to argument and demonstration and not the saying of human beings, which are subject of all kinds of imperfection and deficiency. Thus the duty of the man who investigates the writing of scientists, if learning the truth is his goal, is to make himself an enemy of all that he reads, applying his mind to attack it from every side. He should also suspect himself as he performs his critical examination to, ev to avoid falling into either prejudice or lineage. Shukran wa jazakumullah khairan.